This week on the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. Back then when I was submitting, there was no um, email submissions. It was all paper, so it would take forever and you would just wait and wait and wait. And then you'd get blah, nothing or maybe just an email that's, uh, no, yeah, I had, uh, so many sub- uh, rejections. But I think, too, that also that's, goes back to the, the major point that I keep telling myself, do not give up. Welcome to the Red Sneaker Writers Podcast. News, interviews, and writing tips for people who are serious about having a writing career and want some practical knowledge to help them achieve it. Your host is the nationally best-selling author of more than 50 books, William Bernhardt. Hello, sneakers. I hope you are having as fine a day as I am. The sun is finally shining here where I am. The son, my son Ralph is home from college, and my new book, Splitsville, is getting some pretty decent reviews, if I do say, my, say so myself. I was particularly pleased by some kind words I got from Gary Braver, a writer I have admired for a long time. So, of course, while I was thanking him, I asked him to appear on a future episode of the podcast. And get this, he said yes. And he's bringing with him his most recent co-author. And that would be a little-known thriller author named Tess Gerritsen. (laughs) Yes, you heard me right. Tess Gerritsen and Gary are coming to the podcast next month. And Splitsville brought them there. This is, of course, the first book in my new thriller series. And it is available for pre-order now. You can pre-order the ebook, order the paper version. Release date is May 25th. Jesse, how are you doing? I am doing well. It is also very uh, sunny, but not super warm here as well. It's been great. You've been busy lately, am I right? I have been. A podcast editor's life is never not busy. <laughs> I laugh, but you really are staying busy. The The whole audio chat world is exploding, isn't it? Yes, I I have three audiobooks currently in some form of production, whether it's I'm still editing them together or finalizing the editing or figuring out how someone who self-published their own book, how they release a audiobook. It's it's everywhere. Well, better to be busy than the alternative, right? True. True. I I don't do well, not busy. (laughs) My interview guest this time is Kara Ruda. She is an anomaly in the writing world. Successful business person, having built a realty company so outstanding she was able to sell it to Berkshire Hathaway. She's written nonfiction about business, then she turned to fiction, where she's written romance, women's fiction, and thrillers, including her most recent book that is getting all kinds of good attention, The Next Wife. I want to talk to her about her journey and her writing process, and you can ask her questions too through the chat box. But first, the news. I will never get tired of hearing that. I feel like I'm on Dateline or something. (laughs) Let me start with some quick cuts. Mentioned before that Harper, Harper Collins was in the process of acquiring Houghton Mifflin's trade line. It's a done deal. Also mentioned, we just talked to, I just talked to Jesse about the fad for audio chat, which has apparently been launched by Clubhouse. We now have both Facebook and Twitter launching imitations. Remember when we talked about NFTs, the digital art form that's being auctioned for huge amounts of money? The German publisher Bookwire is now creating a dedicated marketplace for book-oriented NFTs. So you can sell your books and cover art and whatever. Three larger stories this time. First, kind of a follow-up to the last episode when we talked about the ebook scams to steal author's book prize award. This time, it's audiobook scamming. According to the online reporter's advice, uh, there's a lot of fake audiobooks 
that people are making a profit off of. These junk books started because of Amazon's marketing strategy for Audible, which I'm sure inadvertently incentivized the proliferation of basically garbage. As some of you already know, when you complete a book, Audible gives you promo codes. No matter what the content is, if you finish, you get promo codes that can then be given to members of the public who can then listen to the book for free. But Audible pays a royalty whenever the code is redeemed. Well, I'm sure that seemed like a win-win until the scammers showed up. And as it turns out, according to Vice, people were making tens of thousands of dollars a month by gaming the system. They create a basically a, a non-book by scraping content from web pages and then throwing it together in a barely formatted ebook and then list it as a royalty split deal on ACX. Narrators, of course, only get paid when somebody buys it, which in all likelihood, nobody would ever buy this junk. But the scammers would still get codes which have a cash value. ACX doesn't give as many codes now as it once did, but you can still make money, apparently, by keeping the so-called books short, producing a lot of them, and getting someone to narrate them, which probably isn't as hard as you might think because there are over 40,000 people looking for work right now as book narrators on ACX. Jesse, as I think we've mentioned, you're a professional sound engineer. I mean, you could do this, although I feel confident you never would. What do you think about this scam audiobook scheme? I just, I don't, it's it's crazy because I understand the narrator is wanting to do it because it's work and I'm guessing they uh, would get it's where the narrators would get paid the scammers would get paid right but the authors of the actual con like the narrators must know it's a scam like you've read these like tv shows and movies written by bots they don't make sense right uh they're, they're <laughs> sadly the article talked to at least one narrator who's done like a hundred of these and realized they were garbage but hope you know trying to get experience and build up a following which is never going to happen with books of these quality of this quality. Yeah, unless they're really, really good at making garbage uh, really interesting to hear. But yeah, give it a great title and cover and <laughs> really good British accent. Like I feel like you can make it work, but it'd be really hard. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, for that matter, speaking of scamming, Amazon this week announced that it has closed more than ten billion suspected phony listings on their, and yeah, you heard me right. I said billion with a B, 10 billion suspected phony listings. There is apparently a lot of scamming going on. Okay, story number two, Talkia, and that's T-A-L-K-I-A. Thank you, Jesse. Now I don't have to spend it. For those of you who are listening to the audio, T-A-L-K-I-A. This is a company that's developed an AI that they say is so lifelike that it can re you can do your voiceover for a promo video or even do an entire audiobook. And although they don't claim that it's quite as good as a real person, they say it's really close and obviously a lot simpler and a lot cheaper. I listened to a sample and I have to say it's not as good as a real person, but close. And if you don't want to read your whole book, or for that matter, even if, you know, you're doing a book release trailer and uh, you need, you know, it's a thriller. So you need that deep stentorian forceful voice and that's not yours. Well, they can provide one for you. Or if it, it should be a female narrator and that's not you, this is a place you could theoretically go to get the voice you need. Okay, third final story. You may recall last time we reported that there were new studies indicating that reading has genuine health benefits, including even leading to a longer life. Well, now there's another study which says that it will not only do all that, but also improve your love life. This new study indicates that readers are in demand, particularly, say, on dating apps. eHarmony found women who expressed an interest in books on their online dating profiles 
received 3% more messages than the average, while men, wait for it, saw a 19% jump if they expressed an interest in reading. I mean, is there any better reason for it? Yes, there are many, but it is impressive. There's a book site called Book Lovers, was founded about 10 years ago, which is designed for readers looking for romance with other readers. Well, it now has 3,000 members. This isn't just like empty wish fulfillment or snobbery. The, the, there's some real research, and Jesse's posted the link, suggesting that judging somebody based upon their literary tastes can actually provide telling insight into their personality. There's a 2016 scientific study this article mentions that involved more than 3,000 students at the University of Texas and concluded that romance readers are warm and understanding. Poetry lovers are calm and introspective. Erotic novel fans are outgoing, while nonfiction lovers are well-organized and self-assured. What this study doesn't tell you is what reading thrillers says about your personality, <laughs> but I'm going to assume it means that you like danger or adventure. And as it happens, I have the perfect book for all of you lovers of danger and adventure. That would be The Next Wife by Kara Ruda. Kara, are you online with us? I am. Hey, Hi. thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I bet you didn't realize when you wrote this book that you were not only going to entertain, but potentially improve people's love life, right? I, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> and I'm really not a fan of danger either. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if I would believe all of that, that study says, but you know, it was interesting. That was not your motivation. <laughs> no, that was not my motivation. But yeah, that's funny. But I do think people who read are good people. So how about that? Uh, no doubt about it. Okay, here's my traditional first question. If you could give writers, aspiring writers, one piece of advice, and I know you could give many, but if you had to pick one, what would it be? It would be don't give up. Because I really mm. believe that persistence is the only way that you finish a project like a book. And right. um, without that, um, you won't ever finish or start maybe. Mm-hmm. Is that true just of right? I mean, that's true of probably everything, isn't it? And you have done a lot of different things in your life, like before you got, I think, before you even got to writing. Am I right about that? You are right about that. Yeah, and I, I do think that's kind of one of my guiding principles in life is that if you want something and if you want to do it, you need to go for it and just start doing it. So, yeah, I would say that applies to business, to the business of writing, to the business of life. So I read on your website, you've been a magazine editor, mm -hmm. you've been a society columnist, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> which is something you don't hear about so much anymore, but okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, new newspaper, I'm guessing. Yep. Yep. Uh, and of course, also an incredibly successful uh, realty outfit that focused on, on, on women, right? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So my, my background was uh, kind of, I was an English major in college. And then when um, I graduated, I went into journalism and I spent a lot of time in newspaper and magazines, which I loved, but I also always wanted to uh, be Darren Stevens and be witched and go into marketing. So I had a pretty lengthy <laughs> career and uh, I know I didn't want to be the magical uh, witch person. I went yeah, to most Darren. people want to be Samantha. I know, right? Not, I know. <laughs> no, I'm not really sure what happened. I had a marketing professor father, so that might have something to do with it as well. I kind of got my um, I gotcha. MBA homeschooled. But then I went into the marketing world, ended up vice president of an Inc. Um, 100 company, first woman to have an office with a door and the whole shebang. And then my husband was in the real estate business, started acquiring companies and needed a brand to kind of make an umbrella brand for them. And that's when I joined him. And so we created Real Living Real Estate and launched it in 2000 and ran the business together for 10 years. So until we sold it, like you said. Which was long enough, apparently, to build it big enough to attract interest from a major, major buyer. Right. And it was it was good timing because, as you recall, it, it was pretty tough times in the uh, uh, mid, mid to late 2000s. So, yeah, good right. job. 
it, it worked out well, but it, it wasn't easy as uh, Kate and John Nelson found out and the next wife, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely. Well, it, isn't it great when you can use something you know about, uh, something you know something about in, in your fiction? It is. And it's it's a good way, I think, to process, too, because there is a lot of stress uh, running a business with your spouse, no matter the size it grows to. And I mean, if you look at like Bill and Melinda Gates are the latest example of, I mean, they're running a Mm -hmm. global philanthropy, they're raising children and then. Gosh, that's, it's just tough, even if you're not running right. a global philanthropy. So anyway, so I thought that would be a good premise to start the thinking about the novel with. You have had a lot of variety in your career. <laughs> You've written nonfiction, that book on business that I think I mentioned before. Yep. You've written romance novels, some of those with a friend, I think. You've written women's fiction. Now you're writing suspense or thrillers. <laughs> Can you just not make up your mind or, or what's the deal? <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, I love to write. So uh, yeah. I write what in, speaks to me at the time. So the women's fiction started out, my agent at the time uh, had read my nonfiction book, which is Real You Incorporated, Eight Essentials for mm-hmm. Women Entrepreneurs. And she thought the messaging in that would fit well in a fiction form in a women's fiction book. And so it's kind of a mm-hmm. like reimagined way of explaining the same kind of concepts as a woman goes through a midlife crisis and recreates herself. So my first novel was very much inspirational and happy. It's called Here Home Hope. And then from there, right. I just kept getting darker and darker and darker and darker, except for the two years <laughs> where I had a little foray, foray into um, the romance area, which I had never written. And one of my friends started her own company, her own imprint called Thule Publishing and asked me to write for them. So I did two series. And sure. It was really fun. But I think for a writer, writing is the key. So it's not as mm-hmm. much to me sticking t- within your swim lane necessarily all the time. It right. also like fires up your muse a little bit to push yourself in different directions. Well, I think that's what most writers would enjoy most. But what you keep hearing yeah. You talk to agents sometimes. You go to conferences like WriterCon, the conference I put on every fall, just to mention it again. And you hear people saying, uh, no genre hopping. You know, you got to build up a reputation and a following by staying in the same niche. And I would, but, say, yeah. And see, I would say, though, if you look on my website, I have a tab for mm-hmm. authors. And I think it's more important to build your personal brand as the umbrella over all of your stories so that my brand isn't tied to this particular novel that's coming out right now. Like mm-hmm. the next wife isn't my brand. My brand's bigger than that. I like to write about what happens behind closed doors of seemingly perfect lives. And that applies to people who might be in a romance setting, a women's fiction setting, or where I'm writing right now, domestic suspense. Mm-hmm. And so I can take all that over- brand, you know, to different genres. And the brand is Kara, yeah, right? Correct. You like one thing she wrote, you'll like the next one too. Maybe. Possibly. And if you're not if you're not a romance fan, which I hadn't read romance before, I kind of leaped into romance and I just found it mm-hmm. really interesting that it's such an empowering space for a lot of women right. husbands. So I love that. But anyway, um yeah, so I And I'm not necessarily, when I get an idea, an idea pops into my head, it's not necessarily based on what I think readers are looking for. It's what kind of speaks to me. And I know that's probably Mm -hmm. not great, but that's just (laughs) just what I do. But I think you can tell when you're reading a novel if the author is into it and not just doing it for the sake of following in the path that he's supposed to go. Right. Cranking out another one. Yeah. You've also been very... Very varied. That's not very nimble, but whatever. (laughs) And and your approach to publishing. I mean, again, you've been all over the spectrum. You've done self, you've done traditional, you've done hybrid, you've done small presses and big presses. Uh, Are you looking for something or how do you decide how to publish a book? Well, I, I, you know, it's interesting because I, you learn something in every format that you choose to go. I think my dream was always the big traditional book and having a hardcover. And when that happened with my first domestic suspense, best day ever, it was like the thrill of a lifetime. So I'm not saying that that can't be the dream or that it wasn't the dream. It was the dream. But Mm -hmm. my 
my submissions and my agents, we kept getting so close and we'd get into the editorial rooms with one of my novels. And then they're like, oh, it's just not quite right. You know? So it's really, it's hard to get into those rooms and get your book approved. So I felt sure. like my books were good enough that I could try other alternatives. So that's, that's what I did. So I, I don't know, at some point you, you should move forward for yourself if the other options speak to you. And I know I learned a lot doing K and K, Kindle Direct Publishing and Create Space and learn about right. algorithms and how to market. And that really is like being your own business person and trying to mm-hmm. juggle. And nobody who hasn't done it understands all the hats you wear doing that. But I mean, goodness, that really helped when I like stepped into the traditional publishing world and somebody's taking right. care of all that. But you're still watching and you're still giving mm-hmm. input. And so anyway, I think it's all additive. And I think there's opportunities, there's upsides and downsides to any of those choices. And I think you may have touched on the key because I think self-publishing is basically running your own business, but you may be one of the few writers out there who's actually good at that and likes it. <laughs> you know what? I think everybody can do it though. It's just about making yourself learn and it starts with your brand. And that's why I have that tab on my website. And I'm not kidding because mm-hmm. if you know who you are and what you're trying to build long-term beyond just this next book, beyond, your, you know, that's, that's what's important. And you take that and you keep consistent to it and you keep building with each book you put out, whether it's self-published or traditional, that's, that's where the secret sauce is because you are an entrepreneur as an author, no matter where you're publishing. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about The Next Wife. Sure. This is not your first suspense book. I think it's your 10th book overall. Uh, I think I mentioned this to you before, but it's absolutely true. I'd read three chapters and and thought, I want to get her on the podcast. Uh-huh. This is really a terrific piece of writing uh, with uh, multiple viewpoints and uh, and at least, well, many standout characters, although some of them are kind of diabolical. Where, do, where does that come from? Yeah, I like diabolical characters. <laughs> it shows. I know, I know. I, uh, I was writing a, um, a sweet kind of women's fiction proposal for my agent back when uh, Paul from Best Day Ever popped into my head. And uh, he's right. very diabolical and much like Kate or Tish or whoever the bad guy is in the next wife, I'm not telling. They all kind of uh, live in some space in my head. Paul, I always say, was like a mashup of all my spectacularly bad male bosses and their all their like words and stuff were in my head and then they all came out through Paul. So anyway, um, yeah, but I might have a few unlikable characters and unreliable narrators <laughs> <laughs> in my books, but I, I love I love doing that. Well, unreliable, certainly, but I'm not sure that unlikable is exactly, I mean, you've got it, even if you don't exactly admire their ethics or whatever, yeah. you, you can admire somebody who is clever. For sure. And, yeah. And, that's, and and hopefully you do. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Tish, Tish comes on stage first and that's probably who you read the most of. And she is right. the, you know, stereotypical second wife, the next wife. And uh, she's very sure of herself, but she's also very scrappy and she's, she's, you know, come mm-hmm. a long way and she's very proud of where she's gotten to in life and she's going to do anything to hold on to it. And you got to admire that person. And I think that's the key. Sometimes you hear people talk about character creation. People have to like your characters and then people start writing characters that are saints on the first page. And of course, in reality, nothing could be more boring. Right. <laughs> they have to like reading about the character, right? But right. that doesn't necessarily mean they're perfect or saintly or they just got to be interesting in some way or another. Right. I agree. And I think what I try to do with my um maybe more unreliable and um, naughty characters is make sure they have a little bit of dark humor so they can keep you entertained as they're telling their stories. That's such a great thing, point to make because humor, you know, can help anything can smooth over any kind of uh, situation. Yeah. Um, I, I saw some of the reviews on this book and they are stratospheric. I mean, good. And then some, Uh, Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, everybody seems to like this book. How does that make you feel? It's really awesome. I mean, it, you know, because that, that the 
review sites, when those come, you're like, oh, no. And you you hear about that from your publisher, <laughs> at least mm-hmm. I do. So that's, you know, you open the email and you're like, ah. But yeah, that, that's very, <laughs> it's very rewarding when they like what you've done. I really appreciate that. Because, you know. Certainly they, better. Yeah. Once, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Because, you know, once it publishes, you're going to start getting the one star and the two <laughs> star on Amazon. So right. it kind of offsets that. There's going to be some guy on Amazon, you're right, who uh, uh, I ordered this by accident, didn't read it one star or something like that. <laughs> right, right. I hated the first page, one star. I wish I could give it zero. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Which is right. Wonderful of you. Thank uh, you. Yeah. And what would that do to you? That's probably why Amazon doesn't allow it because you can't average a zero into anything. How would you divide? That would mess everything up. It would mess everything but, up. Yeah ones do it well enough so this is and i'll remind everybody listening on the live stream feel free to submit questions for kara by chat but while we wait and watch for that let me ask you another question so this is your 10th book and you've written about every kind of book there is to uh well i can think of a few you haven't but you've written a lot um any tips you've picked up along the way in some moment you were writing and you thought, you know, I never thought about this before, but this is a good idea or any insights? Any insights? You've up? Um, well, I keep taped up on my wall here that um, especially, you know, I th- think when you're writing the first draft or, or maybe stuck on something just to remember that it's your story and you've got it. So I, right. I do, I have like a little sign, don't worry, this is your story. You've got this. So I kind of look at that when I'm uh, maybe pondering, I'm a pantser by nature. So I just write by the seat of my pants uh-huh. and I enjoy that a lot. So most times it's flowing great, but when I do get stuck, then that's what I tell myself. Seriously, complete pantser, no outlining <laughs> at all. Cause this is a pretty involved, a lot of people scheming, kind of book yeah. I would have thought that'd be hard to bring off without some degree of forethought well I don't know if I've been I, I mean maybe subconsciously thinking it out but when I sit down to write I usually have a title and a, one character in mind and then I just start going now I will say my Real. agents are very much encouraging me to give them a little clue as to where we're going next <laughs> so they've, been, <laughs> they've been trying I to get imagine. me to outline they're like can we just have you know just a, a page so I've been trying and, and, you know, I, I told them I would try from now on just to give them a little insight. But, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just my favorite thing is to sit down with a blank computer screen and just start writing. Wow. You mentioned your agents. I hope you don't mind if I ask how did – because I know this is of interest to many people listening. How did you find an agent? How did I find – well, I mean, the, the good old-fashioned way, the um, author query – I believe is the website. Really? Yeah. And just querying and querying and querying. I've been to you sent emails. Yeah, yeah. Been and then sample chapters and then, you know, you kind of build from there. I once I started getting uh once Best Day Ever was published, I think it got easier because uh people are more aware of you. So as your brand grows, it gets easier. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to uh you, you still need to put the work into it and try to find the right match because that's very very key. When I wrote Best Day Ever, I was with Katie and she's awesome, but she likes women's fiction novels. That's what she represents. That's what we were working on together. Right. And so I sent her Best Day Ever and she's like, oh, no, no, no. I don't, I don't read these kinds of books. I don't want to read these kind of books. I'm like, oh no. Okay. Well, that's a bummer because I think it's, you know, you might really like it. My beta readers and said they liked it. And she's like, nope, nope, won't read it. Anyway, long story short, she ended up reading it and did like it and did sell it. But I, you know, I, it's just, uh, that's, that's the biggest, to me, the biggest hurdle is the agent part. So, well, I can imagine. So do you get along well with Katie yeah, yeah, or, yeah. I mean, I mean, we're talking about an author here who can't stick to a genre <laughs> has it published give an all over the place right. and won't give them an outline in advance. So they know what they're selling Yeah, it's a, or going to be selling. I know, I know, but I'm really nice for the most part. So I think, uh, you know, you just, <laughs> you just have to, you just have to stick with it. And like, uh, James just asked when you first started writing, did you receive a lot of rejections? Oh my goodness. Tons the gobs. I mean, back then when I was submitting, there was no, um, email submissions. It was all paper. So it would take mm-hmm. forever and you would just wait and wait and wait. And then you'd get Blah, nothing, or maybe just a email that's uh, no. Yeah. I, I, so many sub- 
uh, rejections. But I think too, that also, that goes back to the, the major point that I keep telling myself, do not give up. That's the point. Yeah, good. Always good advice. I've got a question here in the chat line from Karen, who has, uh, has been with us before and is a terrific author. And she wants to know, she's talking about Best Day Ever, the book you just mentioned, mm-hmm. wants to know if you found it easy to write in the voice of a man. I know, you know, interestingly, because I had those two years in romance, <laughs> I uh, wrote in a male voice for the first time in a male perspective. So I hadn't done mm-hmm. that before because all of my other books have been women's fiction with women characters. So I... Paul just popped into my head and I sat down and his, his voice came out really strong and fast. And he was so clear in my imagination Mm -hmm. that it wasn't hard at all. It was actually kind of fun. (laughs) Yeah. Didn't feel like you were, uh, well, well, you wouldn't care if you were breaking any rules clearly, (laughs) but you didn't find it harder to do. (laughs) No, he was very vivid. And I, like I said, I I had a lot of real life examples of him in my life, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, yeah. So there was a lot to tap into it. It seems. I know exactly how you feel. I've written female characters, including in this next book coming out and, Sometimes people object and I say, look, I grew up in a house with my mom and three sisters. I can probably do women better than men. So <laughs> <laughs> that's just not even an issue. So do me. people object? Okay. I've never heard that. Like people say, oh, a woman can't write a man and vice versa. Very much so. Really? That's particularly in the mystery field, there's been uh, yeah. objection to men writing female characters. But I'm hoping we're past that now. I think we are. Got another. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, there's every other kind of objection out there right now every time you try and do something different. But sometimes writers just got to do what, you know, you think you're being called to do on this book, right? so. So question from James. When you first started writing... Did you receive a lot of rejections? Probably not the top thing you want to talk about, but oh, yeah. no, that's what I just said. I mean, I James, I got so many. I got paper rejections and then it moved to email rejections. And yeah, that's like the name of the game. And it's all a numbers game, so you gotta just keep going. <laughs> so you to... But but you dealt with it, right? Yeah. I mean you didn't let it get you down or think, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Well no, I for anything. sure I have a historical fiction book <laughs> which shouldn't <laughs> surprise you. So that one, I still right. haven't found a home for, but by golly, sometime mm-hmm. I will. So yes, yeah, she's sitting with a bunch of rejections, but I, I'm not going to give up on it. So someday, I mean, I keep mm-hmm. rewriting it based on input and each decade that goes by for it. But yeah. Well, there are a lot of ways you could get it published. We both know right. what you're waiting for the right way. Well, I'm, right? I'm just waiting for a way. Yeah. And I'm also, I know I, yeah, as, as different trends move and everything, I also, it's set in the Dust Bowl and there's this little book out by Kristen Hanna that you might've heard of right now. So, I've heard of yeah, her. So the four wins. She and I both started at Ballantyne at the same time. Anyway, oh, go did? ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So her, yeah. her uh, Dust Bowl book just pretty much eliminates the need for any dust bowl books for the next decade. So I'll just keep mine in my drawer for a while. Yeah. Okay. My dust bowl book is called challengers of the dust, but you're free to borrow Aww. anything you find. in that book. It wouldn't offend me in the slightest, but I live in Oklahoma. Oh, so yeah. I was bound to get there eventually. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, my um, family's from, well, one half is from Luling, Texas. And my grandma used to talk about the dust bowl to me all the time. So very vivid. Sweet. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your writing process? I mean, do you write every day? Do you get up in the morning or your morning person or a night owl or how's it work for yeah, you? Yeah, I'm a night owl. I uh, try to do business stuff in the mornings and then I love to write at like mid afternoon is when I love to sit down. And then if I can't write, really? I mean, I write through the afternoon and evening and then my husband will be like, it's time to stop. Stop. So I'll just think, okay, fine. Spend time with husband. I know, yeah. Right. Stop already. But yeah, I think I learned because when our kids were little, then I would write when they were asleep. So that was kind of, and I'm also a night owl. So that was the natural time to write. Mm-hmm. So when you say you spend time in the mornings with business stuff, do you mean writing business Correct. stuff or you yeah. got some other stuff? No, marketing on? stuff oh. is usually what I'm focused on. Right. Yeah, especially with the book tour. That's, that. That'll keep you busy. Indeed. Uh, if you uh, if you don't mind me mentioning, I know you're involved with a lot of volunteer work too, and I I, I suspect that uh, 
occupies some of your morning time as well. Can you talk about that just a minute? Sure. I mean, yeah, the the main uh, focus I have been spending time on is this wonderful place called the Laguna Art Museum. I live in Laguna Beach, mm. California, and it has one of the largest collections of California art. And it's just, it's a magical little tiny gallery. And we're just kind of um, helping reposition and rebrand it right now. And also with, of course, the pandemic, it's been a really tough time for them. So that is where I've been spending the majority of my time as far as the volunteer stuff. I'll Zoom. <laughs> I'll Zoom. And I'll, right. Yeah. But right. uh, yeah, but I just, yeah. My yeah. back just this California Good. Art Museum. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Good for you. Well, The Next Wife is a huge hit. So what's next? You've probably written two more books beyond this, but at any rate, what's next from Kara Rudin? Next for me is Somebody's Home, and it's out January 18th, 2022. So just a few months from now. And so you can just have me back. I'll be right here. Sweet. I'll have another poster. <laughs> <laughs> that's a deal. And then we'll bring you out to WriterCon yeah, that'd be fine. and take complete advantage of this. All right. uh, it. Kara, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And best of luck to you, too. All right. That was a delight. So in parting, let me, did I mention Splitsville? I'm pretty sure I say that every time. But of course, I mentioned that my new book, Splitsville, is now available for pre-order. Let me also mention that the next guest, interview guest on this podcast, will be my friend and New York Times bestselling author, Philip Margolin, a terrific guy and a terrific writer. You want to be sure and tune in for that. Watch YouTube, subscribe to my channel on YouTube, and you'll be notified every time we're doing one of these things. Facebook, same thing. Until next time, keep writing, sneakers. And remember, you cannot fail if you refuse to quit. See you next time.